In this episode of In The Loop, prenups don't always have the most positive connotation, but more people than before have indicated that they're willing to sign one. We'll tell you more about the history of prenups and why they're growing in popularity. Plus, we are in the eight days of Hanukkah. To celebrate, we're taking you inside a first-of-its-kind pop-up bar in Chicago to see how the owners are spreading an awareness of the Jewish holiday and traditions. This is In The Loop. I'm Christian Bryant. You might have noticed we aren't in our usual setup. Don't worry, though. We'll be back at our desk soon, but we have some changes going on as we prepare to become Scripps News. So, in the meantime, I'm commandeering the Newsy Tonight studio. Before we get to our top story, first of all, can you believe that World Cup final? Came down to penalties, and of course, the big storyline was watching Messi finally get a World Cup win. While Argentina were celebrating their World Cup victory, many in the U.S. sports world had their own very different reason to celebrate. Eight-time WNBA All-Star and two-time Olympic gold medalist Brittany Griner is back on home soil after being released from Russian detention. Griner spent close to nine months in Russia after being arrested there on charges of possession of hashish oil while she played for a Russian basketball team in the WNBA's offseason. She was sentenced to nine years in prison in August and spent the last few weeks of her time in a notoriously harsh penal colony. Her release came in a swap where the Biden administration released a Russian arms dealer, and that sparked some political controversy with former President Donald Trump denouncing the swap. But there's a big fundamental issue here worth tackling. How did any WNBA player, let alone an all-star and likely future Hall of Famer, end up having to take on a second off-season gig in Russia? And what does that say about the underlying pay issues in their league? It's something we'll look at in depth here in a special edition of our In The Loop series on the business of sports, Scoreboard. WNBA players are paid less than their male NBA counterparts. That's a natural result of the WNBA bringing in less money than the NBA. But that's not the only difference in how players in the two leagues get paid. WNBA players also get a lot less in revenue sharing with team owners. When it comes to things like ticket and merchandise sales, they get a smaller slice of the pie. Things like that often push players to second gigs, usually in the form of off-season play in other leagues outside the US. Players are organized in a union, the WNBPA, and they played a big role both in keeping up pressure to free Brittany Griner and to give players better conditions that would allow them to rely on full-time revenue from their careers in the WNBA. The average WNBA salary is roughly $100,000, with a minimum salary of just over 60 grand and a maximum of about $228,000, but that can go higher with certain bonuses. Even the lowest WNBA salaries pay not much below the average American household income, so players can be comfortable, and the season only runs from May to September. There's plenty of room to earn additional income, but it can be hard to do that while also staying in game shape. WNBA teams have to navigate a strict salary cap and other spending limits that the league set to keep all teams competitive with each other and allow owners an easier path to turning a profit. League rules go as far as banning teams from chartering their own planes to get to games. Sports Illustrated reported that after the New York Liberty used charter flights for half the 2021 season, the WNBA issued the team a record $500,000 fine and threatened to terminate the franchise. Keitra Armstrong, a professor of sports management at the University of Michigan and herself a former college athlete, says it's one of the many examples of the system around women's sports blocking growth. There are even structural impediments <clears throat> that would prevent owners who wanted to go all in, you know, because the WNBA were, were thinking that it creates a competitive advantage or disadvantage, you know, with the haves and the have not. So those who could fly on a charter plane would have an advantage over those who couldn't. You could easily, what if that were a requirement for the benefit of the game that all of the owners had to commit to providing that type of resource and that type of transportation for all of the teams? But overseas, playing opportunities can come with a lot more cash. Teams in places like Russia, China, and Turkey pay more as clubs are often backed by government and corporate money or tied to larger clubs that field teams in other sports. Top players can earn salaries that go high into the six figures and can even top $1 million. 
UNLV sports management professor Nancy Lowe says a lot of the gap comes from the fact that American sports are much more market driven and that media coverage is a big part of future growth. Pretty much every other country has a sport ministry and that sport ministry has money that goes directly from the government to run their sport organizations. We clearly don't have that. Almost any time you turn on ESPN, it doesn't even matter what season it is, they'll be talking about the NFL and NFL players, and it could be you know the middle of July um, when the WNBA is going on. That inequity is dollars. That, th that inequity is now being something that we are going to measure because the truth is media creates audiences. The WNBA and the players have worked toward improving the situation stateside. The newest collective bargaining agreement allows players to split certain kinds of revenue 50-50. And while LeBron James and Steph Curry are earning over $40 million this season and getting even more on top of that from merchandise, matching their income isn't the WNBA player's goal. They don't feel the need to earn as much as the men in the NBA do. They just want to split all the revenue 50-50 with owners and they want access to more revenue streams the same way the NBA splits its revenue. WNBA All-Star Kelsey Plum, an Olympic gold medalist who plays for the reigning champion Las Vegas Aces, laid out the issue in a recent interview with the Residency Podcast. In the NBA, um, they have percentages of revenue shared for the players, right? right. So jersey sales, obviously their TV contracts, you see these every year, these contracts get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Yeah, massive. But, but that's because their CBA it negotiates where the, you know, if the owners are making certain types of money, they get that as well. Got it. In the WNBA, that's not the case. Like, I don't think I, I should get paid the same as LeBron. Right. But the percentage of revenue, like, for example, they sell my jersey in Mandalay Bay, I don't get a dime. So let's get some firsthand expertise here. Joining us now is someone who knows a lot of these issues from both the playing and organizing angles. Elizabeth Williams plays forward and center for the Washington Mystics. She has been a WNBA All-Star and is the secretary of the WNBPA, the union representing WNBA players. She spent off-seasons abroad playing in China, Russia, and most recently Turkey. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I want to start with the work that WNBPA put in to help free Brittany Griner. As a group, how did players step in to make sure this release happen or put pressure on parties involved to make sure that Griner was released? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing for us was, you know, keeping her name at the forefront and, like you said, applying pressure. Um, we really wanted to get the attention of President Biden, get the attention of, you know, the government and, and, and making sure that she was never lost in the conversation. So that looked like, you know, posting, um, there are groups that got, you know, t-shirts organized so that we wear them, uh, you know, during the WNBA season, we had 42 on, on all of the courts, you know, regardless of your team. I'm curious to know, you know, what were the experiences like in different countries? You know, did you ever have moments where you worried that something like what happened to BG would happen to you? Yeah, it, it's really interesting because, you know, we're on. We're honestly kind of protected while we're over there. Uh, the way athletes are treated, kind of by the clubs and the president, like we're kind of the prized possession. So, in a way, we we can be kind of isolated. And so that's what made her situation so scary, is because she played for a club that you know the owner is like a billionaire, like super powerful guy. But because of the war and the political situation that was going on, she was really there was no control. And so that was what was kind of the scariest thing because it really could have been any of us that have played in Russia or in any of these places um, where, you know, when we don't have that sense of security from our clubs. But overall, I've had good experiences. I've played in Turkey the last four years. There are plenty of foreigners there, not just Americans, but Africans, other Europeans. Uh, and so that makes it a lot more comfortable. Yeah, we know BG's situation was a unique one, but, you know, just out of curiosity, did it, did it kind of shake up your process uh, at all in thinking about playing overseas? Was this something like, you know, maybe I should, uh, I don't know, stay home during the off season? Yeah, honestly, I have that thought every year. And I think her situation brought a lot of people back. I think there are a lot of people here this off season uh, that typically would be overseas right now. Uh, I took this 
this first half of my off season off just because physically and mentally I was already drained and the BG situation kind of added to it. But uh, there's still the possibility that I'll go back overseas in January because again, uh, an opportunity to kind of get back in shape and, and make some good money. I wanted to move on to the CBA. I know the CBA got set just in 2021 and is set to be in place for at least a few more years, but viewership's jumping buzz is growing and even more exciting college stars are set to join the pro ranks what options are there for you and the wnbpa to address the revenue sharing gap between now and the end of this cba um so right now a lot of that is just dependent on what we generate honestly ticket sales are kind of the biggest thing that drives revenue for us and so um, in the league's eyes, I'm not sure if we're going to talk about this, but prior, prioritization is a big thing. And so they're basically saying um, they're discouraging people from going overseas so that we can be here for marketing deals to kind of get our faces and names out there so that eventually more tickets will be sold and, you know, butts will be in the seats uh, because at the end of the day, that's what drives our revenue. And so once that goes up, eventually we get a share of that. Elizabeth Williams plays for the Washington Mystics, and she is the secretary of the Women's National Basketball Players Association. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us. And I hope to see you at the next Mystics game. I, I live in D.C. and I've yet to make it to a game yet. So uh, mark my words, uh, I'll be in the stadium cheering you guys on. So thanks again for coming on the show. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, folks, we've got a lot more coming your way. Up next, we're exploring how the ongoing U.S. racial reckoning and the events of 2020 are leading to a growing trend of history tourism. We'll explain more in just a bit.